Well, um, it's uh, when Wanda told me to participate to peace building and to this conference, I, I didn't really look up much about it, but I was intrigued by the name, by peace building, because one rarely talks about peace building, especially since one and a half years. I'm a journalist. As a journalist, I always had the privilege of being witness, witness in probably uh, most countries' worst moments, uh, two, three years in Iraq, uh, well, Lebanon, Gaza, I mean, you name it, we were there as journalists, which was a privilege to observe. And um, I have always been observing turning points in history, and that is why I'm very happy that Lamberto Zanier, he is, and, and now you will hear him, he is a Italian diplomat who has traveled through all the crises that have been shaping present-day history. And my personal experience has always been, I mean, I'm old enough that I was already working 1989 in Berlin. And those are those little turning points that you really think something is changing. I mean, history will be made, shaped. You really have that kind of idea. And it happened to me various times. And once, I mean, I, I went to Tunisia, and it was rather difficult because I didn't like journalists there. There was um, Ben Ali. And Ben Ali, I mean, he was, um, in those days, one of the many dictators of Northern Africa and Middle East. And I came out when Ben Ali was in Saudi Arabia, and uh, the Tunisian people ousted him. And there was... So, I mean, we were the only Italian journalists there, me and uh, Claudio, the cameraman. And the people were so happy and that we could tell their story to Italy, to the West, to Europe. And they had such an enormous positive prejudice. And I was elated because when you have these big times of change, there is... Uh, there is an electricity in there that you'd really think, um, well, that the new world will be in the sh shaping and it will be better. It happened to me also in South Africa when this apartheid regime fell. But then reality comes in. And as on our panel you heard before, we are in this moment probably realizing that our world is not what we in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century thought it would be always getting progress, would always make life better, and we would be going towards uh, peace and happiness for everybody. It's not like this. Well, you have probably heard, I mean, about the Ukraine war, yes. Uh, probably they have told you it's the first war in Europe. Wrong, it's not. Um, as you know, I mean, Yugoslavia, we have sort of pushed that in the back, but that was war. And that was hell of a war, and it was in Europe. And probably, uh, probably we could have shaped it differently. And here I come to the first question to uh, Lamberto Zanier. Just two words to present him. He is a diplomat, an Italian diplomat. He has worked for the UN. He has been Secretary General for the OSHA. So he has lived through all this as a spectator, actor, and decision maker. So he can tell us from within. And there was a moment, I told you about uh, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, and then uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And there was a moment where it sort of seemed that the world could be one again, and you were there. Could you tell us about, because what is happening now in Ukraine has a lot to do how we built it, because um, Storbans, he talked about and I would bring that in mind because, I mean, here we have somebody who was part of OSHA. And at the moment, all the international bodies have never seemed so weak. Partly because, I mean, Russia is involved in war. Russia is in the Security Council. We are at loss what is going to happen with international law. We are at loss what is going to happen with international, well, um, the world order. It's not anymore as we thought it when what is going to be next, please. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. 
actually, yeah, I'll be happy to share a few uh, considerations from, from that period. In the 80s, I was uh, uh, in the CSC, this, this process of, you know, this conference dialogue between East and West, NATO, the Warsaw Pact, and the neutral and non-allied in the, in the middle. So I remember, you know, East Germany being there and, and, the, and the Soviets, etc. And uh, uh, it, it was for me a, a quite an amazing moment when I saw the CSE adopting a new charter, which was called the Paris Charter. Uh, there was a charter adopted by the heads of state and government, so at the highest level of these uh, uh, countries of, of the CSC, saying uh, the Cold War is over, uh, this is a new phase, it's opening, a new phase where we have uh, a, you know, a family of, of states. Uh, uh, so we need to build a space of uh, uh, peaceful cooperation. And this is a, an opportunity that we have decided to, to make. And there was a reference to uh, uh, democracy as a key uh, uh, process to which everybody subscribed. And then they said, and then we will, uh, in, in the, uh, we will strengthen the, the organization to have a stronger framework for, for this cooperation. Then I moved on and I moved into NATO and I spent uh, six years in NATO. And I remember that the Russians came there at this point, this point the Soviet Union, it announced in NATO its own dissolution. Uh, and then the Russians came there and they started saying, well, let's start thinking where we go from here. Our vision is that, or the, you know, uh, uh, objective would be to uh, uh, look at ways uh, for us to cooperate with NATO, and then we'll see how far this cooperation. Uh, that was wonderful. I mean, that, the world that was sounded, peaceful, right? sounded sounded really good, <laughs> and in fact, uh, but they they were sort of also putting some conditions. They were saying, well, you you say you tell us NATO is a defensive alliance, defensive against whom? Uh, so perhaps we should also think a, a little bit that the, uh, uh, what do we do uh, with the tools we have? And they were they had some some uh, suggestions. They said you know NATO could be for us an interesting space uh, for cooperation in the field of defense. Uh, it could be a tool uh, to support UN peacekeeping. So we can together maybe discuss how we can proceed in this in this direction together. And in fact, a working group was set up inside NATO on cooperation with peacekeeping, and there were Russians coming every every month, coming and sitting at a high level in this group, which adopted after three years a, a, a document based on the then agenda for peace of Butros Ghali. Uh, so looking very much at the UN, uh, outlining the key uh, principles for NATO's engagement in peacekeeping. But then, of course, NATO, you know, the, the, the war in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia had started and uh, uh, NATO started having its own internal debate, how to intervene out of area uh, was the, the, the kind yeah. of the debate. Uh, but then also the, uh, the Americans started developing what was then called the, the uh, uh, Clinton uh, um, uh, how is it doctrine or whatever, mm -hmm. and 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 the idea was uh, strengthening this this uh, principle of uh, uh, um, uh, democratic transformation of countries based on the notion that you know democracies are so peaceful by uh, definition. So uh, exporting democracy but enforcing it with arms. Export. That well, was. NATO can help whenever these things become difficult. That, that was a big <laughs> idea. But then the second thing was that also NATO should itself become a space for mm. peaceful cooperation. And so the idea of enlargement of NATO started coming up, but in a different way. So Russia is not really ready for that. So we move in a different direction. We start expanding NATO to consolidate a space of democratic development in Europe, uh, which is not against Russia, uh, was a, but of course would not involve Russia. Uh, so Russia uh, at this moment found itself uh, um, uh, on, on the back foot uh, because they, they saw NATO moving uh, towards it with a different uh, narrative than, you know, not, not aggressive. <laughs> And also trying to reassure Russia that this uh, uh, there would be uh, you know no redeployment of forces in the territory of new countries this kind of thing, uh, but the you know the Russians started looking at this with a certain concern. Then of course uh, the, the Yugoslavia crisis had an impact politically. The Kosovo crisis was a major uh, major issue. 
And I will jump back to the OSC, which in the meantime, the CSC had become the OSC. The Russians wanted a really strong uh, organization in Europe. They would have wanted a kind of a regional UN. They wanted a charter for the OSC. They failed on all these points. They only managed to change the name. Even the countries, the OSC is the only international organization that has no member states because they didn't even manage to agree to rename the participating states of the conference into uh, member states. And, uh, and so it, it was only a partial transformation. Uh, but if you, if you look back, uh, in the 90s, there were a string of ministerial and meetings and summits, and in each of them, there were uh, agreed documents, political uh, statements agreed by the ministers. The last one of these was in 2002. After 2002, no matter how strong and how... Uh, 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 how much any uh, chairmanship of the OSC invested in the organization uh, uh, and tried to get a political statement, they always failed. So since 2002, you will not find any agreed political statement, with the exception of a very wishy-washy thing in, uh, in Astana in 2010. Uh, but, but otherwise, uh, at that point, we had gone uh, separate ways. So that was the beginning of the... Uh, uh, how can I say, the watershed and the beginning of the cleavage in, uh, uh, in Europe. So when we look at the crisis in the relations with Russia, in fact, this should not be seen as uh, a new development, but it's something that has very deep roots. We go back to the choices of the 90s. So you told us about, I mean, how it built up, because uh, in 30 years we came from a, a point where the Russians were discussing with NATO to the point where now Medvedev uh, talks about Satan, meaning the West, meaning us. So it is a long way in 30 years. And I wanted to ask you, you know and you have been for work many times to Ukraine and you saw it build up. Now, um, before, um, I think somebody I mean, um, uh, talked about the, that the Russians, the, especially in the last 10, 15 years, for them it was essential to have a buffer zone, and Ukraine was for them one of the buffer zones, and uh, well, Georgia as well, and they would put their foot down military uh, if the West would move too close. But um, did you see this kind of confrontation coming, building up, and how? Because... I mean, there is something very, um, yes, there is an aggressor, and Russia, of course, is the aggressor. I mean, first it took over Crimea. I was there, I remember, suddenly we had this little green man, and then after some months they had also a flag, but that came only afterwards. Now, uh, did you see that coming? But uh, in a war, it's all, it takes two to war, like to tangle. So did you see this building up? Yeah. Well, um, f first of all, uh, Russia, from, I would say from day one, tried to regain some kind of control over the, uh, the former Soviet space. Now, uh, Russia never really fully digested uh, the end of the Soviet Union and being confined to having a, a, a role that would only be uh, you know, regional uh, at best. So they took initiatives, the creation of the CIS, uh, the CSTO, this, this uh, sort of more military uh, arrangement with a number of uh, neighbors of theirs, all former uh, Soviet countries. And, uh, and, and so that was there. But we were warned, by it, we, as, as we were in NATO uh, in the 90s, that uh, uh, if the nationalists uh, were to prevail in Moscow, then the Russia policy on creating uh, its own sphere of influence uh, would become much uh, more visible, much, much stronger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and so, the, uh, so in, in NATO, there was a concern to try to create mechanisms that would uh, leave open doors for dialogue with Russia. But in fact, these mechanisms were, you know, figlicks in a way. And the Russians themselves were never really entirely uh, happy with that. Um, NATO uh, at the time tried also to play a role in uh, uh, trying to uh, demilitarize uh, or to remove as much as possible potential risks from the Soviet space. 
uh, by facilitating, I was myself involved in some of this process, withdrawal of nuclear, nuclear weapons from Ukraine, for instance. And that's what led to the security assurances, security guarantees were given by a number of nuclear states, including Russia, uh, to Ukraine in the context of the, of the withdrawal of these uh, um, uh, of these weapons. Uh, but the, the um, impression was that uh, 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 the perceptions in Moscow were changing, uh, especially with the turn of the century and with Putin uh, taking, in a way, the, the reins of the country. Uh, the Munich speech of 2007 was, uh, you know, giving giving out very clear uh, signals of uh, uh, what the mood was. Uh, we were all very, very well aware of uh, uh, of the risks that were there. So, um, the interaction of the West with uh, uh, former Soviet countries outside Russia. Uh, was a very, uh, how can I say, an issue to be uh, handled with, uh, uh, with, with great caution, in a way. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, there was fertile ground for, uh, uh, for cooperation, but, but in Ukraine, there were a number of complicating factors that emerged from the beginning. One of them was Sevastopol and, mm. and Crimea, so the Russian military presence in, in Crimea. And whenever Ukraine, in Ukraine we had governments that were looking westwards and they started talking about uh, uh, moving towards the European Union or in general towards the Euro-Atlantic institutions, the Russians grew very nervous. Uh, and, and Crimea was uh, a, a focal point of attention because, because of that. So when uh, at some point after Maidan, uh, uh, there was a more clear uh, 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 reference to the possibility that Ukraine might join NATO, I was not surprised to see that uh, suddenly Crimea became uh, became mm -hmm. Russia and the Russians established uh, full control over, over the space that was, you know, always rented to them by former presidents on a on a long term uh, on a long term basis. Um, uh, so. I, I have to say the signs were there, but the atmosphere had changed, and the atmosphere slightly or, or slowly turned into an atmosphere of open competition between the West and Russia. And, uh, uh, and the, in a way, the, the, uh, uh, the label was only that, was always that of uh, 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 supporting forces that were uh, in favor of democratic transformation of the governments. Uh, so that's something that from the OSCE perspective we saw very clearly and we saw very clearly also uh, the role of country, including, you know, the role of the European Union that always tried to reach out. Uh, but within the European Union, so we also saw the differences and the, and the way in which country uh, engage in some cases, in some cases crossing li red lines in a way uh, that were irritating, uh, irritated the Russians. Now, I wanted to ask you, since I, um, I suppose we have got many students that are listening, um, you are a diplomat, and now, I mean, what uh, most of us journalists beriddles us is how do we bring Russians and Ukrainians to a table? I mean, let's, I'm not talking about a peace process, but I'm talking about a simple ceasefire, which seems very far removed. Because, I mean, as we heard, I mean, the world by the UNG has been asked to choose sides. So is that uh, making it more difficult to find a peace space, a country that can, have, can host Russians and Ukrainians where they can talk? Which, I mean, of course, having asked the whole world to choose a side makes it more difficult. On what grounds? And can we talk about a possible ceasefire or peace dialogues? I mean, because there is, of course, a difference in that. I mean, is it going to be Crimea, um, South Korea and North Korea, or is it going to be Kosovo or what? Very difficult. We we heard also in the in the previous panel reference to the fact that now everybody is aligned. Uh, so you are either um, with or uh, or against uh, yeah. uh, one side or the other, and this uh, uh, makes it almost uh, impossible uh, to find someone who can say, uh, uh, "I'm here 
come, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk. But this is only half of the problem. The other half of the problem is the players themselves. Uh, because you will, if even you manage to convince them to come to the table, you will find uh, uh, delegations that will sit there but will not really talk to each other because they, they don't have much to tell. Uh, they want completely different objectives. And they uh, believe that these objectives can only be uh, achieved uh, uh, on the on the battlefield. Uh, so uh, you would have you would need a, a how can I say a, uh, a very pragmatic uh, approach. You need to find uh, channels and people you can uh, you can talk to, which is extremely difficult in this moment. Uh, uh, people that can also make a difference. So my my own view is that. Uh, uh, the, the best thing you can do is, on the one hand, try to identify an agenda of concrete issues on which you can work. That's what the UN are doing with the, 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 the uh, grain deal and this, this kind of things. Mm -hmm. Exchange of prisoners, uh, maybe the atomic agency and the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear plant. Uh, so th there are a number of things you can try to, uh, to work on from an international perspective. And once you, once you start that kind of dialogue, you can try to put slowly other things on the agenda. But even talking about freezing the conflict will not be acceptable for, uh, for anybody, as far, uh, as far as I can tell, because everybody has to say, this was a success for us. So in fact, the, the, the best uh, scenario that I can see is that this uh, happens by default, uh, that the, the sides are you know, getting tired, exhausted, and all that. And then so you- That you means, bluntly, may, may I be blunt, I'm a journalist, too many deaths. I mean, they can't take. They don't have any more people in Ukraine, and they can't manage all the the, the, so the dead bodies in Moscow. You don't even necessarily negotiate a ceasefire, but oh. de facto, by moving the attention to other uh, things, you let the situation as much as possible cool down on the ground. And maybe talking to them separately, you try to convince them to to do that, pending a resolution and uh, uh, still referring to key principles of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, territorial integrity and this kind of thing, which, without which the Ukrainians would never uh, accept to, uh, uh, to, to even start engaging. I don't, I don't think there is the space for, for formal negotiation at this moment. There is no mood and there is no political will. Uh, and, and this is existential. So, you know, uh, uh, Putin is, uh, uh, is saying that, but if Putin is seen as losing, that, that would be a big problem for him. And the same is for Zelensky. Uh, so you can't put any of the two uh, in a corner, in a way. And, and, uh, uh, and this is why a formal negotiation uh, that risks to do that uh, would not really lead anywhere and would probably not even start. Well, um, that's not very optimistic, is it? No. Um, uh, well, how does that leave the UN? Does it leave it, I mean, because this is the first time, I mean, the UN as and even international law is really at stake. Because in all other conflicts, one could say that they had, let's say, nominally, uh, people would listen to them. I mean, the states would listen to them. They would now... Russia being involved makes things different. What's the future for the UN? Well, uh, we have entered a world where power politics are dominating, in a way. And uh, unfortunately, they are dominated to the point uh, that this is damaging uh, the idea of, uh, 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 of a rules-based world order, as, uh, uh, as we call it, uh, which is then weakening multilaterals and weak weakening the role of international institutions. So we are entering into, into a phase that is much uh, less structured and much, much more complicated, much more dangerous, unfortunately. Uh, and and the, Uni the United Nations are suffering from that, as is the OSCE, which is uh, barely surviving, I would say, this, uh, at this point. Uh, so as, as we look ahead, we need to prepare ourselves uh, to operate in this environment that is, uh, uh, is much more complex and less, uh, uh, and less structured. Uh, the UN still have, you know, the authority, uh, of, uh, the authority of, of the, the global uh, uh, representation in a way of the uh, global community of states. So it's a moral authority uh, that they can try to play, and it's very much uh, in the hands of the Secretary General himself. Uh, 
but as, as, as we have seen when he visited the region, when he was in Kiev, uh, he had uh, uh, Russian uh, missiles <laughs> coming in. <laughs> so it was a great welcome. That was, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was quite a, quite a signal as well. Mm. Uh, in terms of respect for the for the role of the institution, from a country who is a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, uh, so this is this is the environment in which also the UN are operating. Uh, one where the kind of respect that we would uh, uh, expect to see is not really entirely there. Uh, uh, this doesn't mean that one shouldn't uh, exist, and the UN has many tools. Uh, so this this agenda we we're mentioning earlier of negotiations maybe on uh, uh, with more realistic objectives to to find an angle to 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 start uh, is is probably the best uh, the best way for them. But one should not be one should be modest in a way in terms of expectations in my view at this moment. Well, um, now I'd like to, and after having said that, that UN has to find a new way, but we, I mean. It's not in the making a new way, but you still have to, I mean, it's a moment of transition, so it can be uh, also a very dangerous moment. What about Europe? Now, um, this war, like probably no other one, uh, I mean, verbally has been, um, uh, it came with lots of uh, nationalistic propaganda from, of course, Russian side, but not only, it has produced like well any uh, in physics a, a kind of um, mirror it mirrored in Europe with nationalism which is also on the surge in Europe I do, we don't know as a response but that is I mean what one can sort of see in the various garments so Europe um, as the dream of this uh, peaceful space after the Second World War, where the safe society, where now, I mean, we are um, looking at this country, I mean, it seems as um, the people who think that they are under siege because a few thousand people are coming uh, shipwrecked to Sicily, I mean, and there is this nationalistic um, rhetoric that is taking not only Italy but uh, many other countries. Is this the response and what is Europe risking culturally? Well, uh, this, this is also part of the, uh, of the larger uh, set of problems that we're all facing. Uh, you mentioned Europe, the United States have the same issue and we've yeah. seen you know, see what exactly. they've been uh, uh, We are facing at the same time a return of geopolitics, uh, partly also due to the way we uh, uh, manage the uh, post-Cold War transition, we we're saying. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is uh, uh, an increasing impact of the global uh, challenges, uh, from climate change to be, when When we talk about migration, sometimes I even wonder, I, I was... Uh, attending the UN summit for the OSC uh, on, uh, on migration and at the time when we, uh, um, migration and, and, and the refugees actually, when then the, the, the uh, uh, compacts were launched. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes I've been wondering whether migration is really the right term, uh, because in fact uh, it's, uh, it's mass movements of population determined by uh, by a combination of factors, yeah, of including climate change, including conflict, including violation of human rights, but including demography, and uh, and uh, which is you know something that you know, uh, I think it came up in the in the meeting earlier, and I'm fully in favor of stronger uh, role of uh, uh, of uh, uh, young people and the youth in uh, in addressing these things because these will be their uh, issues down the line, uh, but. The, the response uh, very often has been a response, uh, uh, how can I say, a protective response by, mm -hmm. by, uh, uh, by, by populations in our countries, which led uh, to policies and to choices, to choices then that were reflecting composition of governments and the policies of governments uh, that were going in the direction of more nationalism and uh, uh, policies that won't help us then uh, address uh, some of uh, uh, the root causes of these uh, of these problems, and uh, 
turn the debate on the issue of uh, you know how do we handle this uh, today and tomorrow as opposed to the uh, to the larger picture um and and this this has an impact because it influences also the debate within institutions and within the european union we see how things uh, are going and how complicated uh, 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 it is getting uh, so unfortunately the internal divisions in the european union are becoming increasingly visible and this is weakening the role of the union and uh, i've seen the, the european union in action or not in action in the case of Ukraine, and mm. I was uh, I was taken aback, I have to say, a number of times. Why? Uh, what did you see? Well, uh, the first consideration is that Maidan started as a result of uh, uh, the preparation for the Vilnius summit, where uh, the Commission and the presidency at the time, which was Lithuania, a very anti-Russian mm. uh, uh, presidency uh, in the, in the European Union, uh, were very strongly pushing Ukraine to do something. I, Ukraine had the chairmanship of the OSC in 2013, so I was in Kiev very often, and I met with Yanukovych a number of times, and I was working with his ministers. And they were telling me, we made a strategic decision, we want to move towards the European Union. But, you know, we have an issue in our relationship with Russia. We depend on Russian gas. Uh, our industry is uh, uh, very closely integrated with the Russian in industry as a you know, the result of the uh, Soviet, U Soviet uh, Union, etc. And we need to reform. So we need the time. And we need solutions that should be ad hoc of some, some kind. We cannot simply jump from where we are into being, mm. you know, a, a new uh, member of the, well, the CFTA, the, uh, the, the various mechanisms. But we need some kind of a transitional element, uh, which was flatly denied to them. Uh, they, they, in Brussels, they were saying there are no tools and we have no mandate to even do this, so they need to sign first and then we'll see what we can do. Uh, but of course, this was not enough for, uh, for Yanukovych himself. He had Putin on his neck uh, increasingly as uh, Vilnius mm -hmm. approached. So in the end, he had to withdraw and said, I cannot sign, I'm not ready to, to do it. And then Maidan started. And uh, and then you see from there. But my feeling was that in Brussels there wasn't. Uh, this was handled by the Commission. It was a technocratic response to a highly political problem. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't see really a debate, a, a strong uh, and, and in-depth political debate in the European Union on how do we handle this issue with Ukraine. Uh, because it may have an impact, etc. So the, the the EU was surprised when they saw this, and the second the second surprise I had is that I went to Brussels a couple of months uh, 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 later after the beginning of Maidan in in end of January, beginning of February 2014, and I was telling them I'm worried about the stability, internal stability of Ukraine, because Maidan is something that is uh, in a way representing. Uh, the, you know, strong views in one part of the country, mm. but not everywhere. So there are increasing divisions in the Ukrainian society. There, were, there was talk about, uh, you know, the status of the Russian language, so the Russian-speaking parts of the country were, felt, were feeling that Kiev was, you know, very distant from them. And this doesn't mean that they were ready to separate, but, uh, but the mm. stability was an issue. And I was discussing this with, uh, uh, in Brussels with, uh, you know, high-level EU uh, people and they were telling me, no, Ukraine is stable. It's fine. We've invested a lot of. Uh, don't worry. There's nothing for the USC to do. We'll take care of the, from you know from the EU side. We'll keep investing money. And then the next things that happened were Crimea and, uh, and Donbas. So uh, even there, uh, I, I was a bit surprised at how underestimated these problems were, and uh, and how the EU. Uh, Sort of uh, had taken its own uh, uh, its its own more sort of bureaucratic uh, approach to to things without uh, uh, without really engaging with all uh, necessary interlocutors. For me, it was easier to see that because I was talking to the Russians all the mm. time, and I saw how the Russians were feeling. Mm. And then traveling in Ukraine, I also saw the differences in the country, which the EU didn't seem to want to to recognize. So these these were 
in a way, and the EU was telling me, and if they, when, when Donbass started, they said, stay out of it, we'll send uh, uh, a mission ourselves uh, uh, to try to, to so, and then uh, <laughs> there they, they were a couple of uh, busloads of uh, officers from uh, Western countries going into Donbass, and they were all taken hostage by the separatists. <laughs> so they spent 10 days, we had to send in people and then activate all possible channels to free them and send them back. And, I remember von der Leyen was a defense minister at the time in Germany, and she was panicking. They said that she had a couple of German colonels there taken <laughs> taken hostage by uh, by separatists in Eastern Ukraine. So there was quite an underestimation of uh, uh, of the intricacies of this, and also the role that Russia was playing behind all these things, because that's uh, undeniable. It was it was very visible. And that's what led then the OSC, in fact, to take the lead and, and uh, set up a pretty large monitoring operation that went on for years. Well, uh, so we can get at two things, that the European Union really does need you who are studying here. They need good international political analysts. I mean, that's the least, let's say. Um, well, um, I was in Crimea in uh, 2014. Well, uh, again, I mean, I went in from Kiev and we went out from Moscow. So. Um, and then there was this um, referendum, and uh, of course the international community, they did not recognize it. But I must say there were some uh, members of parliament, uh, Italian members of parliament, who did recognize him from the Lega. Just, I mean, that's just history. I mean, that's, uh, I was there as a journalist, so that's what um, I, I saw and I witnessed. Um, but tell me, you said you understood that because you said something that, I mean, you just said it by the way, but it makes all the difference because you spoke to the Russians. So, I mean, this communication means not just to communicate with one side, but with both sides. At this moment, I mean, now Europe has chosen uh, to stay and to support Ukraine in all ways possible. And it seems that it has no channel open to Russia. So uh, what is going to happen to Europe and who is going to talk to Russia? And, I mean, once the armies are going to be tired, I mean, what is going to happen to Russian-European relationships? I mean, we can't just do away with that. Yeah, I'm very worried when it comes to that. And I, I think you, unfortunately, you were not here this morning, but there was this morning a, a graph here, which might still be still be here. On, yeah, on, the, on a slippery slope. slope. Okay, slippery slope. Where you have I a wonderful know. world and a nuclear apocalypse there. Oh, wonderful, yes. And, uh, yeah, and these, <laughs> these are the guys that are, in a way, confronting Russia. And every, every time things uh, move, you, you move, in this direction, and then and then you go closer to to the nuclear. Okay, uh, the so nuclear on this scenario. happy note, please. On this happy note, on this happy note. <laughs> just to just to give you, and I, I recognize some of the, some of these things in uh, in the things that I've seen myself. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking to the Russians. You know, the OSC, for instance, is yeah. an inclusive organization. The, the whole Russians point it was created yes. to have a dialogue among enemies you know, between yeah. NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, so now. It would make sense. We have Russia and we have the West, uh, so that could be a space uh, to try to start some kind of dialogue again. Mm. But the West doesn't want to talk to Russia. Mm. They're, they're, they're insults. Uh, they're mm. exchanges that are not constructive at all. In the Parliamentary Assembly of the OEC, Western parliamentarians are trying to expel it or to suspend the participation yeah. of the Russians because the Ukrainians don't want to sit in the same room yeah. with the Russians. Yeah. So the environment is not conducive to a dialogue and to, to, to any kind of uh, uh, any kind of engagement. Uh, so it is very difficult to even begin uh, mm. uh, doing this. So who are the actors? Uh, one was looking far away at China or, or some others, and maybe there is something there. Not not the plan that the Chinese have come come up with, but maybe China could over time provide a conduit. Uh, for this, because it might have interest in making sure that we don't go too far down the slippery slope. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the moment they see this, uh, they might maybe start investing a bit more on, the, on that. But China alone would not be credible uh, uh, enough uh, as for the West and for the, for the Ukrainians uh, mediator in that. 
So China could be the place and could be the space and could be maybe the, uh, the, the, the engine that makes it start, but then you need to create, and that's where the UN and or other players uh, could come in and then uh, play a role and facilitate uh, a kind of a process. But then we need to think also where next, mm. because all the issues came up in previous panels in the discussion, you know, the, the overall relationship between the global south and the global west, that, that is an issue uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is there now. Uh, and uh, uh, that cannot be ignored. It will shape uh, uh, the future. Also, as we're discussing a future European architecture, we can't ignore what's happening outside Europe anymore. Uh, so we we'll have to to factor in also this uh, the impact of these uh, uh, of these issues, including through the prism of the global challenges and how uh, we in Europe also position ourselves on the various. Uh, sets of uh, sets of challenges so it's it's getting very complicated and uh, uh, and we are in a in a in a, uh, in a phase where multilateralism is really struggling uh, so the institutions are not functioning and not functioning well uh, so we we probably need to go back to a phase of more 19th century diplomacy uh, so going back to uh, refine the space and then seeing how much we can rebuild or how much we can modernize uh, what we have to adjust it to uh, to the new challenges. But I think this will imply deep transformations in the way we uh, we operate in future, and it may not be the kind of multilateralism we have uh, we have today. So we have to, I mean, shape it in such a way that it is really peace building and then afterwards peacekeeping. Yeah. And uh, at the previous panel, I mean, um, somebody also pointed out, I think it was Serge, that, um, well, we are used to thinking of the West opposed uh, versus everybody else. Now, I mean, I think we have to start rethinking that. Uh, for demographical, cultural, and whatever reasons. Now, uh, in the next 20 years, um, the most of the population will not be living, will not be living in, a, in Europe or uh, in the US. And we probably have to uh, get rid of our, I would call it, post-colonial view towards Africa and Asia. Because that's what they are demanding. And what are, according to you, the risks? Because I do see this, that they want to take their stand. And they want to uh, prove to the West that they are autonomous. And they don't want to be defined anymore by the West. Rightly so. Because too long that has been taking place. What are the risks within the relationship between... South and West. Uh, th th this is extremely, extremely complex because there are many, uh, many factors, uh, uh, many factors in play. Uh, uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, getting the South more involved and uh, and supporting the south more in uh, uh, developing uh, at a faster pace which however means also engaging uh, at the level of uh, you know at the corporate level and the, 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 the private sector uh, it's not only governments that can can make this uh, make, makes it extremely complicated uh, uh, over time, I think the control of the natural resources will play a key role, and that could become also a driver, in a way, in transfers also of uh, technologies and expertise. Uh, so, so some of these things may may happen uh, out of their own uh, dynamics, and not necessarily because they are uh, driven as a result of a of a you know planned uh, planned policy. Another element that we need to take into account is how deeply and how fast our uh, societies are changing. And uh, uh, sometimes I joke with my, my wife is British and, and she says, you know, she goes back to her place and she says, well, this used to be a very local neighborhood. Now you have three mosques and, uh, and mm. whatever else. 
and they say, well, you, you remember Star Wars, there's an episode called The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is this is what you're seeing. Yeah. But it's, you know, globalization also in our, yeah. in our societies. And, uh, uh, and this over time, and, you know, Rishi Sunak and uh, mm. uh, the, 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 the leaderships in our countries change. And with that, also an understanding of uh, uh, relations and how to reshape uh, relations with countries uh, with which we had a kind of a post-colonial post -colonial relationship needs to evolve. Uh, this might uh, might make it easier, perhaps. So there is that's that's also another uh, another factor at play. Uh, but but certainly there will be at some point a kind of a confrontation the way in which we we are going. So we are, we will have to see also the UN. Uh, you know. The, the, the impact of this on uh, mm. uh, uh, on on dynamics in the United Nations, beginning at the political level, uh, uh, when we see uh, and, and there was a reference to uh, counting heads on, uh, on uh, when when you go in the direction of dividing so deeply the international community, uh, this is a lose lose. Uh, Oh, of course, uh, it's yeah. an acceleration of this kind of confrontation that uh, that you may wish to avoid instead. Uh, so it, it also requires a strong leadership, I think, at this moment, uh, as in every moment of uh, uh, transformation in, in history. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm not entirely seeing happening. On this happy note, if you have some questions, because uh, as they tell me, uh, time is up, and please, uh, I don't know, Yes, they'll be with you. Yeah, Paolo Vergamaschi, I worked as a political advisor for 25 years in the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. Uh, three, three questions. Of course, when I started working, uh, the, the rumors among the diplomatic milieus were that, well, uh, the OSCE is a very good job opportunity. And whenever a peace process goes into the hands of the OSCE, you can be sure that it will be a never-ending story. That was the, the joke behind that. I heard it so many times telling me, so I want to hear the opinion from inside. Second question, which is uh, uh, relative to what you said before. Um, do you see uh, the potential of the OSCE as such? in the future security architecture as strong as it used to be at the beginning when the spirit of Helsinki seemed to breathe all over Europe or we have to start it all over again. Third question, it's about uh, what is your evaluation of the special monitoring mission of the OSCE special monitoring mission in the Donbass and why it failed. Fourth question, sorry. <laughs> is there, is there another one? Fourth one? Uh, you have been for three years a special envoy uh, for Kosovo. I met you there many times. And you came also to the Foreign Affairs Committee okay. in the European Parliament. What is your evaluation of the Ohrid Agreement? Positive, negative, or wait and see? You've got a fifth question now. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you want me to go with these or? Uh, I don't know. Um, do we have other questions and we take them all and then. It's working? Okay. Uh, Luisa Del Turco, Civilian Defense Research Center, Gender Peace and Security Expert. Uh, despite the, the fair gender balance uh, in all panels, uh, nobody raised the issue of the gender approach to peace building. Uh, so I would just like to mention uh, at the European level, we have a very strong local um, forward looking and advanced uh, policy to implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which was uh, actually uh, the, the starting point also for the other agenda that was mentioned in the previous panel regarding youth peace and security, paving the way to the role, to a greater role of the peace local peace constituencies in the peace processes. So uh, this was actually a missed opportunity for Europe because in this policy, 
uh, called Strategic Approach to Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We have uh, uh, positive masculinity, uh, conflict analysis, conflict prevention, uh, gender roles uh, included. So uh, it, it's even stronger and more advanced than the UN uh, original agenda because it, it doesn't match necessarily women with peace and, and with violence. Uh, another uh, initiative I was really looking with interest was the 2021 Secretary OSE Secretary General uh, um, initiative regarding uh, networking and uh, networking platform for women leaders, uh, including peace builders and mediators. So, if you can tell us something about where we are in this uh, regard. Uh, or I just leave it as a comment. Thank you. Okay. There was somebody. Oh, wow. Oh. Okay. Very quickly, since we're talking about like new European peace community, um, one element that's been discussed for a long time is like the. Um, uh, like the UN Security Council needs to be somehow restructured. There is people talking about should we get a, um, rid of the veto system, but there's also the fact that Europe doesn't really talk uh, with one voice because there's no European seat there. So what do you think about it? It's going to be very difficult to convince France, <laughs> but there are people that have said France should be giving up its role to the EU, and therefore the EU should be represented within the UN by yeah, so what do you think about that? Not that the UN Security Council is necessarily that system at the moment, but it would be good to have your thoughts on that. Maybe you should start answering those. Yeah, I think. Of but you here. start with uh, the, the four questions about the OSCE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, I'll run, I'll run quickly through. Uh, the the never-ending jobs uh, uh, relates to the frozen conflicts uh, because the OSC dealt with conflicts that are, uh, are simply unsolvable. Uh, and uh, and you know the, the the last one being the Donbas one where we had this this very large operation. But the the uh, issue there is that the conditions for the solution of those conflicts are not there. Uh, so in a way, it's better to keep them frozen than risking a resurgence of the uh, of the war, as we've seen in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, in a way, there are. You know, the, even the even the conflict there that didn't really resolve anything, but caused a lot of pain uh, and a lot of suffering. Uh, so, in a, in a way, sometimes keeping things uh, 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 blocked until there is, you know, an overall better situation to try to resolve it. But you know, things have not changed over the last uh, thirty years in terms of uh, Transnistria or uh, Abkhazia. Uh, South Ossetia, it has been tried, as you see, and it got, it got even worse. Uh, 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 and, and so it's, uh, that, that's that. Um, potential, sorry, I'm trying to read my own writing. Uh, potential of the OSC in future. Uh, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic there. Uh, the, you know, the rules have been massively violated. Uh, there is a narrative behind this violation, and there are justifications, but still there are violations of the rules. And, uh, you know, you, you don't solve a problem by invading an another country or even denying the right of another country to exist. The things that we heard, we never thought we would uh, ever hear those things. So that's not an OSC issue strictly. It's the issue of relations between countries and, uh, and uh, in international relationships. Uh, but it has an impact on the OSC, and sometimes uh, uh, we wonder whether it's, uh, uh, th there is a need to go back, I'm not saying to the drawing board, but certainly to be uh, uh, more in uh, operating as a conference, as the CSC was in the beginning, as opposed to uh, trying to keep this international organization afloat uh, when the, there is not necessarily a full justification for that. Uh, SMM, my, my evaluation of SMM was very good. Uh, SMM was, uh, it, it came up in a situation, as I was saying, that we had hostages and all and this kind of thing. And I remember discussing with the Russians, the Russians were against SMM in the beginning. And I told them, uh, are you against it even if there are Russian members in it? And they said, well, would there be Russian members? I said, yeah, yes, of course. 
and they asked me how many. And uh, I asked them, how much are you contributing to the budget of the organization? 7%? 7%. And, uh, and they accepted. And they said, but there won't be a Russian contingent. There will be Russian monitors that will sit in multinational patrols with others. So uh, that was, I think, also a good confidence building thing. You had you know, a Russian, a Portuguese, and an American, and a Dane, or an Italian sitting together in the car, uh, doing their own trip or the whole day. In the evening, they had to agree on a report of what they had seen. So there was no room for uh, uh, con uh, you know, opposing narratives. They, they really had to come down, and it worked. Uh, so for a number of years, uh, the eyes of the international community were there. In some cases, they were denied. There were incidents, and uh, also a group of those monitors was uh, uh, um, uh, kidnapped by, by some of the Cossack fighters, in the, the more or less independent fighters in the area. We, struggled to get them freed, but, but uh, it was not a bad operation, and it managed to keep the intensity of the conflict. They negotiated ceasefire, they uh, facilitated repair of lines, electricity, opening schools, so they, they played a positive role uh, in, a, in a way, in an environment where it was difficult for uh, NGOs, for instance, to intervene. There were not many present on the ground because, because of the difficulties of the environment, so an organization like the OSC could play a positive uh, role there. Um, the Ohrid agreement, uh, I, I'm more on the wait and see position. Uh, so let's see, I myself, uh, 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 you know, this assembly of municipalities when I was there, I was uh, always very skeptical about that because I was looking at Republika Srpska and some of uh, how these things uh, work or, or do not work in other places. Uh, so I had, I had doubts. Uh, but, but certainly on the other hand, uh, the, the uh, Kosovars were not really open to considering, uh, um, how can I say, mechanisms that would provide autonomy. For instance, you know, policing, multi-ethnic uh, multi policing, so that in uh, Serb inhabited areas you could have Serb policemen still operating in the context of the Kosovo police, etc. So th th there were mechanisms or possible solutions that the uh, Kosovo's rejected over time, and then if you get all those rejections and you come up with a comprehensive plan that changes the structure of things, then there are risks, in, in my view. Uh, uh, so let's, let's wait and see what the next, uh, the next steps are. Uh, gender uh, was, uh, was key on my agenda when I was Secretary General, 1325, we had lots of events on, uh, on that, empowering women. One of the things I kept saying, though, uh, is that I can, and we, we work on women mediators, the Minsk process, for instance, we had uh, uh, Heidi Tagliavini, the first uh, mediator, was a, a, a Swiss woman ambassador and very good, very authoritative, she did a great job in, in, uh, in uh, uh, driving these negotiations for, for quite, quite some time. Um, but there is one issue, and the issue is the need to work with the countries themselves, because there are cultural stereotypes you put a woman there and she's surrounded by men and she doesn't have the authority sometimes because of the mentality of the people who sit with her. So I want to see also negotiating teams that reflect the composition of the international mediation, uh, mediation effort. And so you need to work with individual countries also to make sure that they accept, they recognize and they uh, um, also uh, how can I say, respect uh, uh, the, the, the role of the mediators, no matter what, what the gender is. Uh, the other point that I always make on, uh, uh, on gender issues is that, and including in recruitment, and the was the second general, my directors were uh, equally distributed, so that there was not, no gender issue in the composition of the secretariat. Uh, but, uh, but I always give priority to professionalism. I don't want quotas. I want good people. And uh, if, it's, you know, if it comes to gender and the, the role of women, I want very good women who can demonstrate to everybody they're professional, they can do the job in a very uh, efficient, uh, efficient manner. And to me, that, that is a very important consideration. Um, Security Council, well, 
first of all, the EU, well, there the, the were two. Now there's only one, uh, of course. Uh, you shouldn't ask me, you should ask the French, but I can tell you what the French will tell you. You know, <laughs> France is a power and, uh, and that's a national prerogative. They will uh, bring to the, you know, to the extent possible, they are aware of, uh, of uh, uh, what EU uh, countries uh, feel and they will to the extent reflect in their own uh, things also consideration of the EU, but there's no way, that's a French seat. So if you want to reform the Council, you either uh, uh, rebuild uh, a new mechanism to replace the Security Council or else you sit with what you have today. Thank you very much. I see Michael's already ready. Thank you and uh, well, have a nice copy. Thank you so much. <laughs>